I am really happy to uh, kick off this cardiac rest session here in Malmö. Before I say anything else, uh, I will of course show you my conflicts of interest. I did receive some research support from the Laudal Foundation a few years ago, and I um, am currently the ILCORS BLS Task Force Chair, which means I do a lot of volunteer work with uh, continuous evidence evaluation and guideline development. So what's this talk about? Well, I wanted to uh, talk about three things that I think everyone should know about cardiac arrest and dispatch. I wanted to tell you our story from Oslo, what our dispatch was looking like and what we did to improve to get, get even better. Oops. So this is the chain of survival. I suspect since you chose to attend this session, you've probably seen this slide many, many, many times. And you probably know that if you were to have a cardiac arrest right now, you would be dependent on someone witnessing that arrest, calling for help, that someone started CPR immediately, maybe that someone ran out to get a defibrillator from the hall, because of course you're hoping you have a VF arrest. And you also know that if you were successfully resuscitated, you might very well need good quality post-resuscitation care in the hospital. Well, what does this have to do with dispatch? Well, dispatch, the dispatcher is, I think most often, the first healthcare, healthcare worker to, to help. It's a person that can help identify that it's actually, uh, that you're actually dealing with a cardiac arrest. They can provide telephone instructions for CPR, and they can even guide the caller to the nearest defibrillator, so they can go and bring that to the patient. Now, I want to elaborate a little bit on uh, the first point. So does it really matter whether the dispatcher recognizes cardiac arrest? Well, I think that it does. I think Jocelyn Burdovsky from Rudy Koster's group in the Netherlands was perhaps the first one to really address this question. Now, they had a look at their, uh, in their cardiac arrest registry. Uh, they compared all the, the cardiac arrests where the dispatcher had recognized arrest to those patients where the dispatcher had not recognized cardiac arrest and found a pretty big uh, difference in survival. So after three months, only 5% of the patients where the dispatcher had not understood that it was a cardiac arrest were still alive. And that's opposed to 14% if the dispatcher actually understood that this is a cardiac arrest. So I would say it matters. High quality dispatch matters. So my second point, uh, how about telephone assisted CPR? I mean, we think that, that bystander CPR is important, but, but does it really do any good? Now, there's a really enthusiastic and um, an active group in Arizona that and I think they've provided us with a lot of what we know about dispatch, dispatch and cardiac arrest. And this paper here is, is from July, and it looks at this very question. What is the effect of telephone-assisted CPR? Now, just going into the registry, grouping uh, all the patients into patients that received no bystander CPR, patients that received CPR with or without telephone instructions. Now, they're finding you know, obvious things that we would expect. P patients that uh, received bystander CPR are a lot more likely to survive compared to those that do not receive any bystander CPR. But we're comparing apples to oranges, we know this. If you're receiving bystander CPR, you're more likely to be younger, healthier, you're out and about, you're more likely to be witnessed, have a VF arrest, and a shorter response interval. And we'd probably expect the people that get telephone-assisted CPR to be somewhere in between the, the patients that don't receive any CPR, more likely to be older, at home, have more comorbidities. And that's basically what they described. Now, they did, um, they tried to identify as many confounders as they could. They did adjusted analysis, they adjusted for the normal things like age, gender, uh, if the arrest was witnessed, if it occurred at home or a public place, and the ambulance response interval. <coughs> Excuse me. Um, and after adjusting for all of these factors, 
they're, they're seeing that the telephone-assisted CPR looks pretty much like the bystander CPR with an adjusted odds of survival of about 50% better compared to the patients that aren't receiving any CPR. So, high quality dispatch matters. Now the third point, What's, is there any role of the dispatcher with, uh, with dispatching a defibrillator? Well, this is not common practice. This isn't, this isn't something that you'll find anywhere, but there are an increasing number of places um, that are actually implementing these kinds of schemes. And I wanted to tell you about the Stockholm experience and the uh, North Holland experience. So the Stockholm experience, um, they were tracking the use of, uh, of public access defibrillator, or, um, public access defibrillators or pads. And you can see the red brown line, there's a sort of steady increase with time but it's nothing compared to the really marked increase in, in sales of public defibrillators. So to kind of mitigate this a little bit, how to get more bang for our buck, how to get these <coughs> defibrillators uh, to actually be used, they started to register them with the dispatch so that volunteers could actually be dispatched to get the defibrillator to the patients in cardiac arrest using their mobile phones to uh, to track where they were and where the nearest defibrillator was. So if you look at the outcomes for, for different, uh, thank you, for different, um, the different groups, you see that for patients that are shocked using a public access defibrillator, there's a 70% survival rate. That's pretty spectacular. And to be fair, only about a third of these patients actually had a defibrillator brought to them. Most of them, the, the defibrillator was, or the pad was on site. But even in that third, 71% survival rate in patients that had a defibrillator brought to them by this uh, dispatching system. Now, the North Holland experience was a little bit different. Um, they weren't able to, to track where people were using their cell phones, so they had volunteers register their home address, their work address, uh, whatever they were willing to sort of guess when they would be where. And if there was a cardiac arrest in, in the vicinity, they would all get the alarm, and if they were at home, then they could respond. So for about 1,500 arrests, they sent out almost 900 of these alerts. And 184 of these pads or defibrillators actually brought to the patients, and 167 patients were defibrillated. Now, 90% of these was, were at home. This is a group we haven't really been able to reach before. So this is pretty significant. And these patients were defibrillated two and a half minutes before the ambulance arrives. <coughs> we gen as a rule of thumb, we, we generally say that survival decreases for about 10% per minute delay of defibrillation. So a two and a half minute reduction seems pretty significant. High quality dispatch matters. So recognizing that the dispatch is so important, um, we realized we had absolutely no idea of, of what we were doing in Oslo. We had no idea what was going on in our own dispatch. So of course, we had to go have a look. And how we were we doing? Well, OK, not great. We were recognizing about 90% of cardiac arrests, which sounds pretty good. But we realized listening to these calls that about 20% of these, we weren't recognizing straight away. Now, typically, that's patients with agonal respiration where the dispatcher is thinking, oh, it's an unconscious patient. Put it in, the, put it in a recovery position. And since we have 10-minute response interval in, in Oslo, then, you know, eventually they'll stop breathing. And then you realize it's a cardiac arrest and you start telephone-assisted CPR. So they kind of fall in the recognized, but not really optimally. And how are we doing with, with our sort of time metrics? Well, I think there, there's a general sort of gold standard where you want to provide chest compression instructions and get them compressing on the chest within two minutes. Well, our metric was three minutes. So it's not, not too far off. But if you then look at the, the cardiac arrests that were recognized initially, it was 2.6 minutes. So we're, it's doing pretty good. But these delayed recognitions was really skewing our median values. 
Oh, look. Okay, so we weren't really happy. We thought we can do better. But how? We needed to understand more of what was going on. Now, we'd measured it, but we didn't really know what the problem was. So we decided to do interviews. And we selected 19 dispatchers from three different centers. They were paramedics, nurses. Um, and we selected them based on recent cardiac arrest calls they'd had. Now, some of them had had really, really great calls, perfect calls. And some of them have had calls that were really challenging. So we picked them to try to learn as much as possible from these dispatchers. And what, what's your strategy? What's, how do you go about trying to uh, recognize a cardiac arrest? And what do you think the main barriers are to recognition? And from these inter interviews, I think we, we learned a lot. Uh, we learned that the dispatchers have varying attitudes towards the clinical support tool or the protocol or the index as we call it in Norway. Um, I think generally maybe the more experienced dispatchers felt like it's better to use my own clinical experience and intuition, whereas the sort of uh, uh, newer, less experienced dispatchers would really use the protocol and use the script in the book. We also saw that there was quite some variation in, in their understanding and knowledge about cardiac arrest and, and agonal breathing in particular. So we thought they might actually need a little more education and training. And when you ask them about what's your strategy, well, 19 different people means 19 different strategies. And when we went back and looked at their actual tool, the index, it doesn't really provide them with any help on how to assess normal breathing. And the definition of cardiac arrest, which is an unconscious person that's not breathing normally, it's not accurate and it's not very helpful because it's not, not, re not really true. That's not really a definition of a cardiac arrest. So what did we do? How do we try to improve? Well, what we, tried to, what we chose to do was um, we actually went for some traditional education talking about cardiac arrest, talking about agonal respiration, looking at videos, um, talking about some practical tips on, on how to do it as best as possible. We presented their own quality metrics, showed them how often they were recognizing arrest, how they were hitting their time targets. Uh, we were also lucky to get to borrow a really nice e-learning program from the Medic One program in Seattle. We did some practical training. <coughs> Um, where they uh, simulated being both caller and call taker in different scenarios. Um, and we initiated a feedback system where every time they had a cardiac arrest call, they'd get a written form with their quality metrics. You recognize cardiac arrest, these were your timestamps. Well, what happened? Luckily, uh, things improved. They started recognizing cardiac arrest more often. We got rid of a lot of this delayed recognition by making them more able to recognize this agonal breathing. And also, these thing, these, this incre increased the telephone-assisted CPR. And our time metrics got better as well. I think probably primarily because we got rid of a lot of this delayed recognition. The time to start CPR instructions was shorter. And they actually got callers to start compressing the chest a little bit quicker. So not perfect. We're working on it. We're getting better. So take home messages. High quality dispatch matters. And if any of you are interested in, in optimizing uh, your own dispatch, I think my tips would be that I think general or specific training is better than general training. What I mean by that is, I think it's better to practice call taking, being the caller and the call taker and, and acting out different scenarios than going to, to, to a traditional CPR course. And of course, measuring quality is key. You need to, with this type of monitoring and feedback, it's, it's extremely difficult, it takes a lot of time. And it's, it's challenging because no one likes to be told that you can do better. No one likes to, to be told that you know, this wasn't perfect. So I think if you're to be successful, it really needs to be a team effort where there's trust and respect. And then I have to <laughs> maybe a little bit of coercion. Okay, thank you.
thank you very much, Theresa, for this. And we have two minutes for questions. There is already coming in one here, which reads, your dispatchers in Norway are nurses, right? Primarily nurses, yes. There are, generally it's set up where you have a call taker, which is a nurse, and you have a sort of a dispatcher, which, which is often a paramedic. So one person that's talking to the caller and one person that's sending the ambulance and, and dispatching the resources. But they sometimes, you know, if there's a lot of calls, the, the paramedic might answer the phone as well. Other questions? Spontaneously, we have one mic. Um, if not, I one, you said that uh, to recognize uh, difficulties in breathing or not breathing. Uh, did you do anything about that specifically to make them be aware of the problems of uh, clinical recognizing this? Well, um, we talked quite a bit about the theory. Uh, we had some videos, like there's a YouTube video of Bondi Beach, uh, where there's a, you know, one of these reality shows that follows the, the uh, lifeguards in Bondi Beach in Australia. And there's actually a video that's really illustrative of a cardiac arrest victim having agonal respiration, where the, the TV crew is there and they zoom in on the face and you can see the agonal breathings. So we showed that video, that was a, that was a huge success, having the Australians run around in their little shorts. Um, I, I think that would, that would generally be the, the main things. Talking about it as a problem, uh, describing what it is and, and seeing videos.